I hope you're enjoying this series. Um, you know, I've had a few people say to me, oh, what are you doing this Disney Pixar films, aren't we looking at the Bible? Of course we're looking at the Bible, but we're just doing what Jesus did was by looking at what's cultural and what themes are emerging in culture. Jesus, he very rarely started with the Bible. He really always started with the questions and the things that people were looking at. And then he led them to the truth and he connected those things together. And that's what we're doing over the summer series. Monsters, Inc. was the fourth of the Pixar films. The first one was Toy Story. Second one was A Bug's Life. The third one was Toy Story 2 and the fourth one was Monsters Inc. It did really well at the box office and actually interestingly enough it was released in 2001 which is really significant when we think about what happened in 2001 and we'll come back to that later. But you see it's set in the world of Metropolis. This is a world where monsters live and they do what humans do. They live like humans do but but they do this strange thing that there, there are doorways or portals into the human world and they go in through these doorways into and this sounds really weird the way I'm going to say it out loud. They go into kids' bedrooms and they scare them. And when they scare them, they take the fear and they take the fear into this kind of gun and they harvest the fear and the fear becomes fuel for the whole world to be sustained on. And it, it's set in a factory called Monsters, Inc. The main characters are the scariest monster of all plus his sidekick. Here they are. Sully and Mike, okay, these are the two uh, central characters. Now, here's the thing that's really interesting about Sully and Mike and all the rest of the monsters. They go through the portals, the doorways into the human world and they scare the kids. But what the kids don't realise till later on is that these guys are scared of the kids as well. Aren't we all scared of kids? Because what they've done, they've been told that children are dangerous creatures who are toxic and if you get touched by a child, all kinds of horrible things happen. So both of these, the monsters and the, and the, and the kids, are all fueled by this fear of each other. We scare because we care. And you know, when you look at these kind of films, there's so much rich meaning. I mean, we could have gone down the line of clean, dependable energy, which is a really important theme, one that we're going to look at as a church in the, in the future. But I'm not going to go down that track. I want, I want to come into the central themes of what I think this film's around. You see, the film centers all around the subject of fear. The kids are afraid of the dark, the unknown. Uh, but the kids are afraid of the monsters because the monsters are threats to their safety and security. Of course, they're children. We're adults. That's nothing to do with us, is it? We, we, we don't suffer with fear anymore, do we? Yeah, yeah, of course we do. And really interesting, isn't it, that this film was released in 2001. And of course, 911, all that happened in the world that seemed to have almost, like, like when we look back in history, we think about 911, we think about 2001 as almost like a year that reset or, 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 or was a new transition for the whole planet in terms of how we understand fear. Regardless of um, who we are, fear is a powerful force. The fear of failure, the fear of change, the fear of rejection, the fear of loss, the fear of the future, the fear of missing out, the fear of being ordinary, the fear of heights, the fear of financial ruin. You could fill in the blank. We all have these fears in our life. And regardless of its object, fear has the ability and is capable of absorbing us, capturing our hearts and minds and leading us to the prisons of anxiety and worry. Fear makes adults defensive and controlling and it makes kids just scream. But here's the thing. Fear may fill our world, but fear doesn't have to fill our hearts. Fear may fill our world, but it doesn't have to fill our hearts. And the film has a powerful, and I believe a spiritual message. And I think the message is simply this. We each have a choice, and here it comes. We each have a choice. We can be fueled by fear or we can be liberated by love. And when you watch the film, you see these are the two big themes. We can be fueled by fear. The fear that the monsters take from the kids literally is turned into this, what they call clean, dependable energy to actually sustain their society. But actually, actually they find that fear doesn't do a great job. Love does a much better job. And you can either be fueled by fear or liberated by love. So I want to look at those two things this morning. So what does it mean to be fueled by fear? You know, we're good at fear. In fact, there are so many fears that we have as human beings now, it's amazing. So many phobias, it's hard to keep up with. There are the classic ones, the ones that we know, arachnophobia, you know, agoraphobia and all that. But here's some ones that you might not know. Let's see, anyone have a, have a wild guess at what banana phobia is a fear of? Bananas, absolutely. And here's the second one, uh, pogonophobia is a fear of bearded men. 
Now, what a fear of bearded women is, I don't know. We didn't check that one out. But a fear of bearded men is pogonophobia. Now, what about this one? Panphobia. I thought maybe that's the fear of being in the kitchen with pans. Actually, it's the fear of everything. It's the fear of everything. And here is my personal favourite. Anyone want to say, this is hippopotamonstroses quipedaliophobia. That's pretty good. Hippopotamonstroses quipedaliophobia, which is the fear of long words. Really, it really genuinely is the fear of long words. And then here's the final one I want to look at. Anyone want to know what that was? Nomophobia. Nomophobia is a recent phenomenon. This phobia is characterized by feelings of anxiety that arise from being out of the range of service for your mobile phone. Not having enough credit, not being able to get Wi-Fi, all those things combine to give us this fear, nomophobia. Okay, these are some of the fears that we have to deal with. But you know, there's good fear. There's good fear. There's a good fear that keeps us safe and protected. There's the fear of the Lord, the Bible says. The fear of the Lord, the Bible says, is the beginning of all wisdom. Now, when it says the fear of the Lord, it doesn't mean being frightened of God. It means having a respect, having a reverence, having a right sense of who God is. There's good fear, but there's also a lot of bad fear. And the Bible has a lot of bad fear as well. There's the bad fear that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden, the first created people, when they almost had that fear, might God not be enough? Might God not be enough? And so that fear drove them to make a catastrophic decision and choice. There's bad fear. There's Abraham um, who went down to Egypt with his wife, Sarah, and he had a bad fear that, that maybe that people would, uh, his wife was attractive and, uh, and maybe people would take it. And what he basically said was, some harm could come to me, so you pretend to be my sister. He lost his integrity over that kind of fear. There are the spies that went into the promised land as Moses brought them out of Egypt and through the desert and he sent spies into the promised land uh, and, and tw- two of them came back and said, it's great, yeah, there's some giants, but it's great. Ten of them came back and fear caused a generation to be lost in the wilderness. There's bad fear. And there's the bad fear of the religious leaders around the time of Jesus and the fear of the threat that this man Jesus was to their power and their prestige and it l- resulted in them putting him on the cross. There's bad fear. You see, when you're fueled by bad fear, guys, bad things happen. I was listening to a podcast when I was away on holiday, and a guy called Erwin McManus, one of my favorite uh, communicators and writers, and, and he said this, it, it, I'm sure it was a throwaway line, but he's just so genius. Your fear establishes the boundaries of your freedom. Your fear establishes the boundaries of your freedom. In other words, if you're afraid of heights, you stay low. If you're afraid of people, you stay isolated. If you're afraid of, uh, you know, or insecure, you, you kind of stay safe. Your fear establishes the boundaries of your freedom. And maybe today you are fueled by fear, whereas actually Jesus wants you to be liberated by love. Liberated by love. And you see, this is what we have. And maybe for some of us, and we know this as parents, maybe it's for our kids. I think one of the big issues, isn't it, for all of us is, is that fear associated and attached to our kids. Can we let them go? Can we let them climb on that thing? Can we let them go to school? Can we let them go to university? Can we let them go on an overseas trip? Can we let them go? Can we let them go when they get married? All the fear that's associated with our kids. But you know, when you're fueled by fear, really bad things can happen. I was reading this week about in World War II, uh, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and brought, the America, uh, brought America into the war. You know, I didn't realize this, but after that, there was such a lot of, of, of anger, obviously, and, and, and fear in American culture. They rounded up 120,000 Japanese Americans and put them in prison and detained them. They hadn't done anything. But they were like them. They were like the others. They were like the monsters who'd attacked us. And so out of fear, they put 120,000 in prison. It took till the 1980s for the American government to apologize for what they'd done. Why did they do it? They were fueled by fear. Fear of the other people. Fear of the monsters. And that's exactly what happens when we're fueled by fear. Fear can cause us to lose our humanity, even turn us into monsters. And I've written on my notes, say something political, okay? But I ain't said what I'm going to say. Now, I very, very rarely say anything political. But I want to say something into people saying something political, all right? If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, please 
Please think about who your first allegiance is to. It is not to the Labour Party. It is not to the Tory Party. It is not to Brexit in or out. It is to Jesus Christ. And I get absolutely staggered. You can have political views. That's great. I've got political views as well. We need to be careful. We are not culturized into being fueled by this fear that dehumanizes people and creates other people to become groups of monsters. And I'm staggered when I look at social media. Uh, many people who claim to be followers of Jesus are, I think, being fueled either by fear or worse. Have your views, that's great. Let's remember we belong to Jesus. And every single person is created in the image of God. And what happens when we're fueled by fear is that we create this kind of thing. Oh, you're all this. So if you went to Eton, then you're all that. If you've got socialist views, then you're all that. If you're Brexit and you're out, then you're all that. If you want to remain, then you're all that. That's absolute garbage. We need to be better than that, don't we? Come on, we need to be better than that. We need not to be fueled by fear because we lose our humanity when we're fueled by fear. We need to be liberated by love. And in the film, it all changes with our hero, Boo. Here she comes. Next, car- next one, please. There you go. It's all changed by this amazing little girl. You see, Sully, the big scary monster, he stumbles into Boo's room and everything begins to change. He becomes afraid of Boo, but actually Boo begins to delight in Sully. And she finds a way through the door, through the portal, into the monster's world. And um, she sees the monster differently and she begins to love him for no other reason than she just does. Even though he's unlovable, she loves him. Even though he does all he can to shake her off, she keeps loving him. And the transformative power of that love begins to change his heart and eventually transform his actions. You see, we can be fueled by fear or we can be liberated by love. And I want to look at this second theme, liberated by love. Because Sully soon finds his heart changing. And he soon finds himself risking everything for Boo. You know, he risks his best friend Mike. He risks his job. He risks his reputation just to keep her safe. Even if it means he'll never see her again. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the liberating power of love. All right, enough of the Disney Pixar stuff. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible actually say? I want to look at one verse with you this morning, okay? This is so good. So let's go. Such love, 1 John 4, 18. Such love has how much fear? Say it louder. Has no fear. Because perfect love expels how much fear? Sorry, come on. Expels how much fear? Thank you. All fear. If we are afraid... It is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we've not fully experienced his perfect love. Perfect love drives out, is the old version, casts out, expels all fear. We can be fueled by fear or we can be liberated by love. This verse is written by the Apostle John. And the Apostle John was the the, the apostle, the disciple that that it says, in fact, he wrote this, the one that Jesus loved. Interesting that he wrote that. Anyway, I'm sure he was. Uh, and and he, he was an amazing guy because he, he didn't die like all the others died. In fact, he was exiled on the island of uh, Samos, uh, no, Patmos. And, uh, and um, he, he was there. And it's amazing because, because not only did he write these letters to John, but he wrote the Gospel of John. And he wrote them this letter anyway towards the end of the first century to the early churches as they were beginning to be established around Asia Minor. And in the Gospel of John and the letters of John, John's themes are like these binary forces that are at work in the world, like light and dark, truth and lie, uh, life and death, fear and love. They're these two binary forces that are at war with each other. And he writes to these Christians to anchor them to this concept and this truth that God is love. He doesn't just love. He isn't just loving. He is love. And John's saying, and when you live in this kind of love, when you anchor yourself in this love, when you get into this perfect love, it will drive out all fear. Drive out the fear in here. Drive out the fear that drives you to, to monsterize, and I've just made up a word there, other people, to dehumanize and make others different to yourself. When we live in real love, not Hollywood love, not Disney, Pixar love, but real love. When we live in real love, we understand who God is. See, real love has its origin in God. We are never more like God than when we love. Real love has a double relationship to God. 
It's only by knowing God that we learn to love and it's only by loving that we learn to know God. That's why John says, if you say that you love me but you hate your brother, you're a liar. Because there's a double connection there. You cannot say you love God and hate other people. Which is why it's so disturbing to me when I see on social media such hate. I'm sorry, it isn't just political views. It's hate being poured out. Come on, we've got to say, how can I hate people of a different political persuasion or a difficult belief to me and say I love God? I can't do that. I can have views, but I can't do that. Real love is a revelation of who God is. It's demonstrated in the fact that God sent His only Son, Jesus. Real love is the explanation of creation. You know, um, I was at a wedding recently. I've been at lots of weddings recently. And, and, I, and I spoke at this wedding. It was in Wales. And as, as I came out of the, uh, the, the, the um, church, that's right, that's where it was, in the church, <laughs> forgot that for a moment, uh, and we were just about to throw confetti. And someone came to me and said, so are you one of these Christians that believes there's no dinosaurs? And I'm standing here with confetti in my hand. And I'm like, now? Seriously? You know, now? And then we end this whole conversation about, you know, Christians have different views. about. Do you really believe that the earth is 6,000? We have all these kind of conversations just about to throw confetti. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter so much how. It really matters why. And whatever you believe about the creation of the world, there is space for lots of different views. What most important is this. Who... And why? How God created it. I don't know how exactly he did it. And there are lots of views. But I know why. For love. Because real love has to have someone to love. That's why God created this planet. Because love has to have someone to love. It's an explanation of free will. Without free will, there is no real love. It's an explanation of redemption. If we just had law and justice, you and I would all be in trouble. But God loved us so much that he gave his only son. And it's an explanation of eternity. God doesn't just love us for the here and now. He loves us for eternity. That's amazing, isn't it? So how do we live in the real world? Not fueled by fear, but liberated by love. I honestly think, if you've never seen this film, you watch the film now with this talk in mind. And you see it through these kind of lenses. How easy it is for us to become like the monsters. You know, easy it is to, 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 to dehumanize other people, to, to live in fear, to be fueled by fear. But how do we live liberated by love? I want to give you four practical things. Number one, choose to live in love. Choose to live in love. Make your address, make your residency in love, not in fear. I want to go to that verse again and look at it in a bit of a wider context from the message translation. It says this, God is love. When we take up permanent residence, great phrase, in a life of love, we live in God and God lives in us. This way, love has the run of the house, becomes a home and mature in us so that we're free of worry on judgment day. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ. There is no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear. Since fear is crippling, a fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment is one not yet fully formed in love. I want to say, we all have fear. We all have fear. Our world is full of fear. Our hearts don't have to be. We have to choose to live in love. You know, Alison and I had a, were on holiday recently and we were having a great time in Zante in Greece and it was brilliant. And then on kind of about day six or seven, we had some really difficult news from back home. And in that moment there, it was so difficult. In fact, I got up from the sunbed uh, and talked to the the hotel about whether we could fly home earlier. It was that serious, but, but, but we didn't and, uh, and it turned out okay. And, but there was a the moment there where, where we were gripped by fear, gripped by fear. And we had to choose to, to, to where we're going to live, Do you know what I mean? where we're going to place our trust in fear or in love. And fear is a real issue for every single one of us. We can choose to live in, in love. Secondly, let's choose to lead with love when it comes to other people. And I want to speak into this. You see, you see, when I, when I was look, watching this film again and, and preparing this, I thought, isn't it so human that what we do is that we, we dehumanize other people, don't we? And we almost like create monsters. And, and it's so tragic. I woke up this morning to, to the news of the shooting in El Paso. Yet yeah, another American shooting. You just can't get your head around it. And it seems, it seems, we don't know yet, that there's maybe a specific kind of hate crime around that, a targeting of certain individuals. We don't know that, but that's what it seems at the moment. Isn't that so tragic? 
And of course, none of us would ever do that with a gun. But we do it with our words, don't we? And we do it with our posts on social media. And we do it with how we view other people. Because what fear does is it creates otherness. So other people, oh, they're, they're others. They're, they're different to us. No, you see, listen. Love realizes that the other is actually your brother. The other is actually your sister. The other is a human just like you. Just like you. Fear dehumanizes the other, but love humanizes the other. Every person you lock eyes with is somebody that Jesus died for. So, so that person that doesn't look like you, that doesn't act like you, that isn't the same color as you, that doesn't, doesn't do what you do, that, that, that doesn't look like you, that doesn't, doesn't think like you, they are your brother and sister. They are human created in the image of God. Fear creates distance. Love creates proximity. The monsters never let the kids the other side of the door. It all changed when Boo found a way through the door. What would our relationships look like if people that we create as other found a way through our door. People of other sexuality, people of other religion, people of other political persuasion, people of other football teams. What would happen if we created space where we're not going to be fueled by fear, but we're going to be liberated by love? What would that look like? It could be amazing, couldn't it? could be absolutely amazing. Fear assumes the worst, but love believes the best. So I want to encourage you guys, choose to lead with love. When it comes to that person who's other than you, don't be fueled by fear. Lead by love. Say, hey, I'm going to love. I'm going to love. I'm going to reach out. I'm not going to shut the door. I'm going to open the door. I'm not going to back away. I'm going to step forward. And then choose to fuel love rather than fear. What do I mean? In another twist in the film, the scream factory becomes the laugh factory. You see, they discover that the power of liberating love and laughter, not fear, is a better energy to harness than actually the fear they were harnessing before from their screams. So the fear-based economy of Metropolis was found to be unstable, so they developed this different kind of energy, and it's, lit, and it, and it's regenerative, and it's love, and it's laughter. And the writers in the Bible knew how much laughter and how much joy were connected to love. Which is why Nehemiah in the Old Testament says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's why, it's why David says that weeping may last for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. It's why the Apostle Paul, who's in a Roman prison, and he doesn't know whether he's going to live or whether he's going to die. And he writes uh, many letters from there. He writes a letter called uh, Philippians. And in this, he writes 15 times in five chapters, in four chapters, he uses uh, the word joy or rejoice in either of the two words. 15 times in a noun or a verb. And the original word that he uses, chara, it literally means inner gladness, delight, deep-seated pleasure, depth of assurance and confidence that ignites a cheerful heart, leads to cheerful behavior. It's a deep down sense of well-being. It's like, I know, he says, in the prison, that there's another in the prison with me. And so I've got joy. And that joy fuels him rather than fear. And I think one of the important things is when you are in times of fear, you've got to decide, are you going to fuel that fear or are you going to fuel the love? What are you going to use to fuel that? And you see, if you feed your fears, your faith will starve. If you feed your faith, your fears will. And so even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's praying and he says, I don't want to do this because I'm fearful of it. He says, yet not my will, but yours will. And the Bible says in Hebrews, it was for the joy set before him that Jesus did that. The joy set before him was you and me, it was a relationship with you and me. You see, we can be fueled by fear or we can be liberated by love. So choose to live in love, choose to, uh, choose to lead with love, choose to fuel love. And then finally, choose to receive love every single day of your life. And you know, you know, for me, I, I want to wake up every day and say, Jesus, thank you for another day. And I want to receive love from you today. Because if I don't receive love from him, I haven't got a lot to give out. I have not got a lot to give out. And in a final twist in the film, Mike, the monster, Solly's mate, he sees the transformation in his friend uh, as he sacrifices everything for Boo. He's so inspired, he chooses to be liberated by love rather than fueled by fear. And there's a closing scene, and how powerful is this? You're going to see it now, where he literally shows the palms of his hand, the wounds and the marks, where he held the door open for love rather than for fear. See, both of these guys move from being fueled by fear to being liberated by love. I want to close with one final verse. Look at this verse. 
This is love. He loved us long before we loved him. It was his love, not ours. He proved it by sending his son to be the pleasing sacrificial offering to take away our sins. You know, I don't know about you, but I, ne I never want to get over that, do you? I never want to get over the fact that God loves me so much that he sent his best, Jesus, to, to, to show his hands of what sacrifice really is all about so that I could know love. And in the rest of my life, I've got a choice. I can either be fueled by fear that creates others as monsters or I can be liberated by love that opens doors for others to experience that love too. In the book um, called Grace in Practice, a guy called Paul Zile, he writes this, Grace is love that seeks you out when you have nothing to give in return. Grace is love coming at you that has nothing to do with you. Grace is being loved when you're unlovable. How many of you ever know you're unlovable, yeah? It is being loved when you are the opposite of lovable. This is the theme of that film. This is the theme of the whole Bible. This is the theme of humanity. God loves us so much that he gave us Jesus, grace, when we are unlovable. 